morning, everybody. Great to see you. Those of you guys online, welcome to the service today. We are excited about this second week of the Joshua series. Uh, just one other announcement I need to let you guys know about. Um, so the, this period of September is generally the time, and it is this year, when we uh, receive elder nominations from the congregation. So if you have folks that you think uh, meet the qualifications to, as a biblical elder, you can su submit those nominations. There's a box in the lobby. You can put their, the name on there and just put it in the, the box, and the nominating committee will uh, look through all of those names at the end of the, end of the month. So we have two elders that will be... Um, Riding off into glory. No, they're 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 still going to be around, but they uh, they've they've maxed out their uh, ability to serve after serving six years, uh, six consecutive years, and so there will definitely be two vacancies on the elder board this year, and so we're receiving nominations to um, replace those uh, those positions. So we appreciate uh, your uh, participation uh, and recommendations on that. All right. Well, today is the uh, second week in this series uh, through the book of Joshua. And last week, I, well, I hope all of you have gotten the journal. If you haven't picked up the journal, there are plenty of free ones in the lobby. You can pick those up. Uh, those journals have uh, places to take sermon notes. It has, uh, in, fact, in fact, the entire book of Joshua is in there. Uh, you can take that to your small groups. Uh, and it has daily devotionals that go along with what we've been talking about on the weekend. So I hope you are making use of that. So last week we, talk, we introduced the book of Joshua and we talked about the idea of all of us have been maybe inherited positions or jobs or responsibilities or tasks or assignments that maybe we didn't want, maybe we don't, didn't even like, uh, but we found ourselves taking on a new responsibility. And sometimes those positions are, as I said, things we don't want. Sometimes they are things we want. We want to achieve. We want to go after. But it, it requires going into a new territory, a new responsibility, a new season. We talked about how Joshua very much entered that season when Moses, the patriarch, the, the prophet, the man of God, passed away. Joshua was then called to do what Moses was forbidden to do, and that was to take the people into the promised land. And it was a job that he didn't necessarily ask for, but he was the man for the job. He was the man God had called. And so in your life, whatever season you find yourself in, maybe it's a difficult season, maybe you're entering a new job, maybe you've just moved here, you've taken on a new responsibility, I want you to know that you are the person for that job. You are the person for that responsibility. So as you move towards your calling in that, as you move towards what God has for you to do in that, there will be a defining moment. In our lives, whenever we're moving towards new seasons or new responsibilities, there's always a singular defining moment that charts the pathway for the future. How many of you know there are significant moments in our lives, a singular decision, that will send our lives in a significant direction for a long period of time. Not every decision does that, but there are defining moments in our lives that do that. And often, as humans, we mark those moments with ceremony, right? Something like a wedding, or an anniversary, or a dedication, or birthdays. They mark their, their significant moments in our lives. And as we mark those moments, it's not always as, it's not always with gifts and presents and cake. <laughs> Sometimes those defining moments are emptying out an office. <laughs> You're fired. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that reaction. Yeah, somebody, somebody is concerned for their job. <laughs> it's like, whoa, yeah. Let's throw this one in. Changed door locks. <laughs> when you go in Monday, your key won't work. It's a defining moment. <laughs> But there are these pivotal moments. It could be having to sell the house. It could be moving offices into another space. It could be taking on new assignments. It could be a resignation letter. It could be a admission to a 
educational program. It could be a trip home from the hospital with that little bundle. Those are defining moments in our lives. They are, they are, they are crossings, as it were. We were, we were one way before that. We are significantly different after that. Joshua was on the brink of the Jordan River. And, they, and he and the people were one thing on, on the east side of the river. And they were something different on the west side of the river. They were wanderers. They were, um, they were disobedient. They were outside the promise of God on the, on the east side. When they would cross, they would be stepping into the promise. They would be stepping into the land flowing with milk and honey. And in our lives, there are those moments that are significant. So how do we, how do we savor those moments in a way that is God honoring? How do we memorialize? How do we remember those moments that are so important? Because friends, no matter what your age, no matter what your station in life, you have not crossed your final defining moment. There will be more. There will be other defining moments. So how do we make the most of those defining moments? Joshua chapter three and four tell us the story of the crossing of the Jordan River. So to catch us up with that, remember Joshua chapter one, Moses, we are told, is dead and God commissions Joshua to lead the Israelites into the promised land. He promises Joshua that he will be with him just as he was with Moses. And he urges him to be strong and courageous. Joshua, at the direction of the Lord, commanded the people to obey the instructions of the Lord, to be obedient to him, and that, as the Lord said, you'll be successful wherever you go. We're told that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, this, these two and a half tribes that had uh, already received their land. It's a really fascinating story. I won't spend a ton of time on it, but they had already received, received their land, but they made a promise when they settled that whenever Israel took arms to conquer the land, that they would fight with their brothers, that even though they already had their land, that they were still gonna do their part to make sure that the rest of the tribes got their land. So here are these two and a half tribes who had made this promise. Now we see in Joshua that they're keeping their end of the deal. They're stepping up and they're like, we're with you. Even though we're settled, we've got our, our piece of uh, property, we've got our land, we've got our territory, we're still gonna fight with you because we want you to get what was promised to you as well. So then in Joshua chapter two, fascinating story. Unfortunate we didn't have time to spend a whole week on that, but it's the story of the spies and the prostitute Rahab. Joshua sends spies into Jericho to spy out the land to kind of get a, some surveillance and some reconnaissance. And the officials find out that there are spies or suspect there are spies in the land. And so they, they try to capture them, but the prostitute Rahab hides them because there's a lot of men that go in and out there. It's a great place to hide. <laughs> Facts. Aren't you glad you came to church? <laughs> Nothing suspicious about men going in and out. So she, she hides them. And, but she asked the spies to promise her that when they, the Israelites, take over the land, conquer the land, that he, they would remember her and her family, that she would be remembered. And then in Joshua chapter three, we see that Joshua leads the children of Israel to the banks of the Jordan River. And God instructs them to follow the Ark of the Covenant as they cross the river. And when the priests carrying the ark step into the water, the river stops flowing and it allows the people to cross on dry ground. Joshua calls the people to consecrate themselves because he says, quote, tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The Lord will drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And God also gave Joshua this personal promise. Today, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel that they, will know, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And that's the promise, friends, for every one of us who are in a new season. 
just as God was with Moses, just as God was with Joshua, just as God was with your predecessor or with your aunt or with your mom or with your dad or with your uncle or with whatever that godly figure is in your life that preceded you, just as God has, has, was with them, he will also be with you. So in these chapters, chapters three and four, we see the crossing of the Jordan. So let's read chapter four, verses one through 14, which is this really significant um, crossing. But Joshua gives some instructions on how, to, how this ought to be done. And I think it's instructive for us as we have crossings in our lives to know also how to do them well. After the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua. Choose 12 men from among the people, one man for each tribe, and command them, take 12 stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the priests are standing, carry them with you, and set them down at the place where you spend the night. So Joshua summoned the 12 men he had selected from the Israelites, one man from each tribe, and said to them, go across to the ark of the Lord your God, Go across, yeah, go, go across to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you lift a stone onto its shoulder, one for each of the Israelite tribes, so that this will be a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean to you? You should tell them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the Lord's covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the Jordan's waters were cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a memorial for the Israelites. The Israelites did just as Joshua had commanded them. The 12 men took stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each of the Israelite tribes, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the camp and set them down there. Joshua also set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan, where the priest, carried, the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. The stones are there to this day. The priest carrying the Ark continued standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people in keeping with all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people hurried across. And after everyone had finished crossing, the priest with the ark of the Lord crossed in the sight of the people. The Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh went in battle formation in front of the Israelites as Moses had instructed them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed the plains of Jericho in the Lord's presence. On that day... The Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they revered him throughout his life as they had revered Moses. 22 times in these two chapters, the Hebrew word aver appears. It's the word we translate crossing over, passing over. 22 times, it keeps reappearing. It is a constant repetition, and there's, the reason it is repeated so often is because this isn't just a river crossing. This isn't about just trying to find the safest route to a new land. This river, this crossing, is a boundary. It's a line of demarcation. It's a point of transition beyond which things will forever be different for them. On the Eastern shore, they were pilgrims, homeless wanderers, judged by God for unbelief, restless. But on the Western bank of the river, they would be home at last. From the wilderness to a place of covenant blessing, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And the Jordan River was that border between the two. And so in the book, the, 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 the writer of Joshua tells us over and over, this is a avar. This is a crossing. This is a passing. This is a big event. It's not just a movement from point A to point B. It's a transition from curse to blessing, from rebuke to renewal. Before they could make the crossing, they were given some pretty 
specific instructions in chapter three. In chapter three, verse three, it says, as soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length, or about 1,000 yards. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. So they're not, a, they're not allowed to just cross the river whenever they want to, or just whenever they feel like it, or to take the, the, whichever route seems best. No, they're, they're, they're told to let the Ark of the Covenant go before them because what? They've never done this before. Some of us are in situations and circumstances in life and you're like, I've never done this before. I don't know what it's gonna take to get through this. I, I've never seen this before. I've never had to face these challenges before. I've never been in this season before. I've never faced these obstacles before. It's exactly what Joshua and the Israelites we're dealing with. You know, when a person becomes a Christian, it's something very much like this. It's not that they just got religious or all of a sudden they started going to church or that they've adopted a new lifestyle or turned over a new leaf or just made a, a point to be better Someone who has become a Christian has crossed the Jordan. They have gone from a spirit of darkness to a spirit of light. It's a defining moment. It's a crossing. It's going from death to life. What has happened is unprecedented. It's a, it's a new way of life from then on. We know this because some people what, they have tried and failed at what? Just trying to clean your life up. How many of you tried that before you came to Jesus? I'm just gonna clean my life up. I'm just gonna do a few things here, try to, you know, just kind of be, I just wanna be a better person. And you probably, like all of us, <laughs> failed miserably because you can't do it on your own. You can't do it in your own strength. There must, listen, there must be a crossing. You cannot be a, a native of the promised land, listen, living in the wilderness. You cannot make yourself a resident of the land flowing with milk and honey when your feet are standing in the wilderness, there must be a crossing. And you will not experience the blessings on the other side until you walk across the Jordan. There has to be a crossing. That's why people are so stumped sometimes and it's hard to, to compel them to, to, to trust because it's like, well, I don't understand, like, how, how do you have this peace? How do you have this joy? How can I know that God's with me? You're not gonna know it from the wilderness. I can tell you all day long, I can quote all the Bible verses, I can, I can line up 500 people who can tell you about the promised land. You won't know it and experience it until you walk across the Jordan. You've gotta do it. And hey, no one's walking for you. You've got to walk it. The Bible is full of these amazing miracles of God, but you know what God didn't do? He didn't walk for the Israelites when they left Egypt, and he didn't walk for them over the Jordan. They had to do it. He promised, he went before, but they had to do it. That's why the apostle Paul will say, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is what? Gone. Everything becomes new. Paul isn't talking about try real hard to be a good person. He's talking about 
a crossing entirely new. So what can we learn from Joshua about navigating these crossings in our lives uh, with some wisdom and some spiritual awareness? Number one, cross over with God first. With God first. Prioritize the presence of God. You, you notice that they, they were instructed to keep their distance from the ark. <laughs> like 2,000 cubits, like 1,000 yards. Now this isn't about like, now there is a place in, uh, in the scripture where someone touched the ark and got dead, gone. Because <laughs> they touched it in an in a unwhole, unrespect, a disrespectful manner. But the purpose of this isn't just that. It isn't, I don't think it even is primarily about the holiness of God. Like stay way, way, way far away because, there, because this, is, this represents the holiness of God. I don't think it's primarily that. I think primarily the reason they're to stay so far away is so that they can, could you get this visual, guys. You got the, tw- the 12 tribes of Israel around the ark, a thousand yards away. And he, the, the, the ark is in the middle. And the reason I believe is that so that they never lose sight of who's leading them. So that no matter where they are, they can always see that God has done this. That God is leading us. That God goes before us. So they're prioritizing the presence of God. It's not some weird mechanism for getting across the river. It's the point that God goes before us. God himself is going to bring us across the Jordan so that they could always see him. God's presence is the one thing that we can't miss during crossings. In Joshua chapter three, verses nine through 11, he says, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you that he will not fail. We sang that, right? He won't. How do we, he will not fail to drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, Gergesites, Amorites, and Jebusites. How? The living God is how you will know because he will drive them out. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. So how do you go from the wilderness to the promised land? How do you cross over? How do you take a bold step? How do you step into that new season? You prioritize the presence of God. You prioritize the presence of God. Go with God first, with God leading the way. So how do you do that practically? Well, you have to build an ark. (laughs) No. (laughs) Seeing if you were listening. You have to build an ark and you carry it everywhere. (laughs) The way we prioritize the presence of God is through the things we've all heard about so often, through daily prayer and scripture reading, daily. Man, if you're going through a crossing, it's good to read the scripture daily regardless, but if you're in a season of crossing, make it a priority. If you're in a time where things are changing or you're in a new season or you're stepping into and and things are disorienting and confusing and you're not sure you can make it or how you're gonna make it, prioritize prayer and reading the word of God daily. Those prayers may be our daily times in communion with God. It also can be something as specific as a prayer of dedication a prayer of consecration. You're stepping into that new assignment, that new office, that new home, that new neighborhood, that new responsibility. That child comes home and is there for good. (laughs) (laughs) You step into that bedroom and you consecrate it to the Lord. Literally, you consecrate that space, that role, your mind, your position to the Lord. 
You dedicate it to him. You do it through journaling. If you're a journaler, by writing things down. What is God saying to you? What is he teaching you? What is he showing you? How is he guiding you? What are the things he's showing you that you should be looking out for, that you should be, take initiative on? Write it down. Worship, engaging in worship, lifting him up, exalting him through music, art, creative outlets, whatever refocuses your heart in adoration and worship to Jesus. Always have him before you. And I would say, declare scripture. Find those scriptures that, de- that, de- that speak to the season that you're in and cling to them. I'm gonna give you seven that are related to se- seasons um, without any explanation because that would make this a very long message. But here are seven scriptures for, se- for new seasons. Number one, if you need... Some guide us in trusting God's plan, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Strength for in difficult times, Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you need God's, a reminder of God's faithfulness, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you need peace amidst change, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you need God's guidance, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your, your, straight, your path straight. If you need contentment in a season that is uncomfortable, Philippians 4, 12 through 13. I know how to be brought low and I know how to be abound. In every, any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If you need God's presence, a reminder of his presence in the midst of transition, Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. He will, make, he will take delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Write those down, memorize those, or maybe others that speak to the season you're in and know them and cling to them. Let them become a banner over that, that crossing in your life. Joshua illustrated and taught us to prioritize the presence of God and also to memorialize the crossing, to put a stake in the ground, to remember those significant defining moments of our lives. So Joshua 3 and 4 describe the crossing of the Jordan River. And basically this crossing occurred at springtime, which is... uh, when the harvest took place in Israel and the snow melts in the mountains and the March rains turn the Jordan River into a raging river. Those acquainted with the geography say on other times of the year, the Jordan River is not that hard to cross. It's wide and it's shallow. There are a number of places along the Jordan you could cross, except this period, the springtime which makes it incredibly difficult to cross on foot. Now, why in the world would the Lord choose the most difficult time of the year to lead the children of Israel right up to the Jordan River and basically say, now's time? Well, if you serve the Lord more than five years, you're like, that sounds familiar. (laughs) or if you are a student of scripture you're like yep that sounds right (laughs) that's what that's what the Lord does if there's if because because human beings we are so prone to to steal listen to steal the credit from God and if there is any way you can do it on your own you will take credit for it. 
So the only way that God is ensured to receive the glory is if there's a circumstance where there is no way you did it. So he will lead, I'm sorry, that's just how we are. If we weren't so stubborn, God could work with us a different way. But we are stubborn and we like the glory and we do not like to give credit to God. So God says, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, no, we're, we could have left uh, Shittim early. I said that word, Shittim, early. <laughs> it just all depends how you, where you put the pronunciation, but it's S-H-I-T-T-I-M. <laughs> you say it how you wanna say it. <laughs> Regardless, it's a place you don't wanna be. <laughs> There's a lot of it and it stinks, so you wanna get out of there. But God could have let them stay there longer. Like, let's just wait it out here until the waters go down, or let's leave early. No, 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 let's wait till all the snow melts. Let's let the river rise. Now it's time to go, guys. It gets right up to the edge. And you know there are people, there's some, there some humans in that group who are like, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. <laughs> Do you know there, is a, there are a lot of other times of the year this would work. This is such a bad idea. <laughs> but waiting until the children are sick and tired and fatigue, and there's a deafening roar of water. Now let's go. It's a terrifying moment. But why did God lead them there when it was so scary, when it's this daunting, when it was flood season? Because God wanted to exalt, listen, God wanted to exalt himself in the presence of Israel. Yeah. And you know what? Jesus did the same thing. Do you remember uh, the story of Lazarus? They said, hey, Lazarus is sick, Jesus. And Jesus loved Lazarus. It was one of his best friends. And Jesus was told that Lazarus was near death. And you know what the scripture says? When he heard that Lazarus was near death, he waited two days. He waited two days and told the disciples, this will be for the glory of God. And two days later, just like Jesus knew, people can't, like, you know what? Jesus is too late now. Lazarus is dead. Don't even waste your time. And Jesus, with just a word, raises Lazarus' dead body to life, and God received the glory. Yeah. So God does this to receive glory. And so Joshua tells the people, I want, you to, I want you to build a memorial at Gilgal, which is the, 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 that's the west side of the river. This is gonna be a public memorial. I want you to stack stones. I want you to take stones from the riverbed when we cross over. I want you to take stones from the river, riverbed and when we get to the dry ground, I want you to stack them. One stone for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So in verses four through seven, we see that Joshua called the 12 men and had them stack these stones so that they would be a sign for future generations because stones don't stack themselves. We have to stack stones when God does something in our lives, when we are in crossover moments, we need to stack some stones. Why? So that when people come by and like, how did that get there? What does this mean? Why did you put that there? Why is that wall hanging on your wall? Why do you have this there? What does this mean? I wanna tell you what it means because stones don't stack themselves. God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. 
The stones would be a sign reminding them of this remarkable miracle of walking over on a dry riverbed. God's people often fail in their trust of God because we forget the great things he's done. So we stack stones because they help us. They help us share God's mighty deeds. When people say, what is this about? How did this get here? How did you make it this far? God did it. These stones were once under that water, but now they're on dry ground. How'd that happen? Let me tell you how it happened. God did it. God did it. It helps us to be encouraged that he will do it again. Memorials aren't just a pointing backwards. They're also a a speaking and a preaching to right now. Not only did God do it back then, he can do it right now. Just like God delivered them, he can deliver you. It's an encouragement that he will do it again. It helps us know that God loves the next generation. How many of you know stacking stones isn't for that generation? They know why it's there. They know how it got there. You know who it's for? Future generations who don't know the story. Those who don't know, who haven't heard. It's an opportunity to teach and to remind future generations of the goodness of God. It reminds us that God does not change. You know, there's a certain permanence about memorials. Yes, they start at a specific time, but there's also, over the years, there's a certain permanence about them, right? Because they're there through all the weathering of, of, the, of the year. Year after year, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter. Over, there's something about a memorial that's, oh, that's a reminder. You think of the national monuments that, that are con- they sort of always preach. They constantly preach. We just commemorated Remember today, September 11th, just a few days ago, the memorials around that, they preach constantly. They speak constantly. They're a constant reminder. And when it comes to spiritual memorials, they're a reminder that God does not change. He's permanent. He's there through all the changing seasons of the year through all the ups and downs of life. So when you're in a crisis moment, when you're in a disappointing moment, when you're in a scary moment, we're reminded by those stacked stones that God does not change. So they did as Joshua commanded. They took the stones off the riverbed. They placed them at Gilgal. But In chapter four, if you read it closely, there's actually two memorials that are done here. And for me personally, I think the second one is more powerful. The second one was not about publicity. It was a personal, private memorial. This one, no one would see. But Joshua knew it was there. So Joshua himself did a memorial. Yes, the the people, the 12 tribes took stones out from the bed of the river when it was dry and put them on dry ground. But Joshua did the opposite. He took stones from the dry ground from the east side of the Jordan and brought them down to where the presence of God was at the river bed when it was dry. And he built a personal monument there, a reminder for himself one that would eventually be covered with water. No one would even know it was there. It would be one day hidden by the floodwaters. In just a few days, as soon as the, the presence of God came, went through, and the, Jordan, and the children of Israel crossed to the west side, that, that memorial would be not seen anymore. It would be covered with water, less visible, submerged in the river. But it represents a private and intimate recognition of God's work, the very place where God acted in a deep and powerful way. I can imagine Joshua when his kids said, hey dad, can you show us those memorials on the Jordan? Joshua would would take them to the river 
And he probably wouldn't bother too much time with the one on dry ground. But he said, I wanna tell you about that one out there. That, I don't see anything. It's just a river. It's just a flowing, yeah, out there is a memorial because out there is where I should be. Out there is where we should be. Underneath the water, overcome, drowning, not surviving, but God has let us out. So I'm never gonna forget that one. Because if it had not been for God, we would have been overtaken by the torrent. Because that's where we were standing. So I built that memorial on the riverbed when it was dry. But it shouldn't have been dry. God did that for me. Out there, listen, out there in the water. God saved me when I was in the water. Not when I was on dry ground, but when I was in the water. Listen, when I was vulnerable, when I was at my greatest risk, when anything could have happened and it would have overtaken me, salvation didn't happen here, it happened there. That's the one I'm talking about. It's that memorial. It's the one that's six feet underwater, 12 feet underwater. That's the one that I remember when I was in the dangerous place, the vulnerable place, when God kept his word and he exalted me in the presence of Israel. God did it. Yeah, praise God. So I will never forget. How about you? Where are those moments in your life where God's grace and deliverance saved you? High water that no one else knows about, but you know. In the fire and in the flood, and in the storm and the despair, when God met you there, don't forget. Come back to that riverside and worship. Remember what the mighty hand of God has done for you. About 10 years ago, our family was in probably the biggest, well, not probably, it was one of the hardest seasons of our lives metaphorical and literal fires on every side. Our house had burnt down. It would be struck again and damaged twice. Spiritual warfare, leadership warfare, all of it. We were at the riverbed. And during that time, my wife was having to, because we were in temporary housing, our house was being rebuilt. My wife was getting three kids to three different schools from a different place. Had a lot of time to listen to Christian radio. (laughs) (laughs) And during that time, there was a song that became a memorial for our family. And when we hear that song, it takes us back there. It takes us back to the riverbed. And it's a song by Building 429. It says, we won't be shaken. Hear the words. The world has nothing for me. This life is not my own. I know you go before me, and I am not alone. This mountain rises higher. This way seems so unclear. But I know that you go with me and I will trust in you. Whatever will come my way through fire or pouring rain, we won't be shaken. No, we won't be shaken. Whatever tomorrow brings, together we'll rise and sing that we won't be shaken. We won't be shaken. Whatever will come my way through fire and pouring rain, we won't be shaken. And I bet you have memorials in your life. There's one thing I want us to see before we wrap this up. 
There's a beautiful picture of Jesus in this story. The rocks that were supposed to be wet were placed on dry ground. The rocks that were never supposed to be wet were placed at the riverbed. There's this beautiful picture of substitution that happens. Do you see it? Do you see it? Those rocks came and replaced the rocks that were removed. Rivers, water is a sign. Think Noah. Rivers, flowing waters are often a sign of judgment. That rock that came and took your place on the riverbed was Christ. He came where he didn't have to go so that you could come on, so that you could go where you didn't deserve. That is the redemption of Jesus. That is the memorial that Christ reminds us of. That's why we look to the cross and are reminded he went to the riverbed. He went to the lowest place. He went where he didn't have to go, where he didn't deserve to go so that he could deliver me and set my feet in a place I didn't deserve. And he did it because he loved me. Yeah. And he loves you. He loves you. He loves you that much to meet you at your lowest place, to deliver you and to save you and to walk with you across. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Wow, it's a holy moment, Lord. We sense it. We sense your presence, your power, and your grace in this instant. We say, welcome, Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. If we had 10,000 lives to say thanks, it wouldn't be sufficient for all that you've done. For the times that you came when the fire and the flood was raging and in grace and constancy and strength you walked us out. Lord, maybe there are some right now, they're on the riverbed. Maybe they're, they feel shaken. Lord, I pray that they would hear from your word and the spirit today that they will not be overtaken. That greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't made that crossing, the most important crossing of putting their faith and trust in Jesus for salvation, Lord, I pray that today they would do that. They would surrender their own will and lay it at your feet and receive you into their lives and choose to trust you and obey you and to walk with you. And Lord, may you fill each person with your Holy Spirit. May your love and power and grace surround each one, letting them know that they are yours, that you love them, that you're with them. Thank you, God, for taking our place. What a wonderful Savior. What a marvelous God. We love you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, my friends.